All right, good morning, guys. Uh, I am going to give you some notes on Stephen Crane's um, episode of Warp today, uh, which in your book is beginning on page 508. Uh, so if you'd like to look at that. Now, hopefully you already read it <clears throat> and you're looking at this as a review or if you're working from home just as a way to kind of, um, I don't know, get a little bit of further understanding of, of this work, which really is not that difficult, to be honest with you. But I do want to talk about some things that are important to know as we go through it. So first of all, the big thing to discuss is the concept of naturalism. Naturalism is a movement that kind of re uh, developed in reaction to Romanticism. Romanticism was, <coughs> excuse me, a uh, literary, it was a movement period, but in the literary realm was about, you know, the power of the individual, uh, the individual, the beauty of nature. It had magical elements kind of because it showed the power of what one person can do. Um, you know, th there was, there was elements that weren't always super positive, but the fact is, is that it definitely made it seem like, you know, the human being, we individually were, you know, of massive power and that nature uh, acknowledged our power. And, you know, it was a, um, I don't want to say like corny type of writing because that's definitely not, not fair, but it, it, it was today, I would say a lot of it hasn't aged well. People look at it like, yeah, right, uh, today. Now, naturalism is the reaction to that, where we have a lot of writers start tackling how, you know, and and I'm not I'm not saying I agree with all of this. Okay, I am I do love this writing for the record, but but I am going to say that this is what it was. This is facts, not my opinion. Uh, naturalism was a reaction that said basically that nature is not nice. Nature is not pretty. In fact, it's pretty scary, and it's much bigger than we are because in fact, as individuals, we don't have the power we think we do. Um, we're at the whim of all sorts of things we can't control, you know, our birth, you know, where we're born, who we're born to, you know, what race we are, uh, any kind of like deformities or uh, hindrances you may have, mental or physical. A lot of these are things you don't control. So you're given that set of uh, boundaries to begin with. And then throughout life, you're at the, uh, you know, whim of chance, you know, whatever happens, you know, you're a farmer, you can work as hard as you, you possibly can, you can do everything right, and there still could be a drought, and you could lose everything. So naturalism tackles those topics, and let's, uh, and, and while yes, it, it can be seen as very depressing writing, when we finish this story, we're going to bring up a question about, you know, the validity of this type of writing, and whether it, um, whether 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 it is good good writing, you know, very few people like it from what I've seen, but I, I actually do love it. Um, there is a point your book makes on five hundred six that I think is really interesting. It points out that uh, in naturalistic works, characters are often victims of their own instincts or of a violent world, and they endure their suffering with quiet dignity. That's one of the keys: is that enduring the suffering with quiet dignity, not by yelling and f fussing and whining and tearing their clothes and screaming to the heavens. Um, it's more about, you know, understanding that nothing I can do will change this, so I'm going to endure it. It's not depressing in that people are, like, you know, killing themselves left and right because life is so unfair. It's more about how they uh, learn to deal with these things and just understand that, you know, this is the situation I find myself in. You know, let me soldier on, okay? So um, we're going to see several examples of this. And Stephen Crane is one of the – There's, I would say there's two writers – personally that I see constantly linked to this. Stephen Crane's one of them. The other one's going to be Jack London, who we're going to look at uh, in a few few uh, lessons, I think. So uh, let's talk about Stephen Crane first. Well known for writing The Red Badge of Courage, something many middle school students are tortured with throughout America. Um, I say that not because it's bad writing, but because it's given at the wrong time. There's no way a middle schooler should be tackling naturalism. There's no reason for that to be something, in my opinion. Uh, some schools wait till ninth grade. Uh, Again, probably a little young for dealing with such weighty and heavy material. Uh, I think they teach it in middle schools because the language isn't the most difficult. And you, even in what we're about to read, it's not that difficult. Uh, Crane is not that kind of writer, but he does do a lot of really heavy stuff, which I think is a lot for younger kids, okay? So I got my notes in my book right here. We're not Again, I'm not going to read it to you. Um, I'm expecting that you've done that, but I do want to talk about some basics of it. So if you look on page 508, you get a little paragraph that talks about the background here and the background sets up that um you know 
this the Civil War, and by the way, when we talk about naturalism, the Civil War is one of the main things in the U.S. anyway that really sparks this move towards more naturalistic writing because you, people saw how awful human beings actually were. You know, In this time period, you might have read stories in the newspaper about wars happening overseas. You might have some family members who remember what it was like to fight in the War of 1812 or things like that. But to see neighbor turn against neighbor and, you know, family members against each other, you know, kind of like what we're seeing in our world right now or in our country right now. It, it just shows you how garbage people can be at times. And uh, the writers, you know, writers are uh, very sensitive to this type of thing. And it really colors their writing to point to, you know, how awful, um, you know, things really can be. And yes, I understand there's nothing, you know, a lot of people get upset about that. Well, why be negative? Why not just be positive? Well, because sometimes we need to, just ignoring things doesn't make it go away. You know, at some point, hard discussions have to be had and people have to deal with it. And one of the, Stephen Crane, Jack London, all these guys were really good about having these hard discussions, okay? So Stephen Crane's writing about world, uh, not World War, uh, the Civil War. He uh, did not fight in it, but he interviewed uh, prodigious amounts of soldiers and people who were involved. So he feels like he's got a good understanding of it. And uh, this one deals with something that maybe you don't have access to. Okay, and I'm reading a section from the book. It says, uh, the conditions in field hospitals were so primitive that twice as many soldiers died from infection as from combat wounds. So we're going to be dealing with that in this this is a background element of this story. The idea that this this man who is shot in the story is, you know, terrified when he gets to the medical tents because you know you're gonna get infection and die. Perhaps you're gonna have you know the of the limb that was shot, you know, leg or arm cut off. Uh, more than likely, uh, amputation was one of the only ways they dealt with things back then. And it wasn't like you were given medicine and you were asleep and they would, you know, cut it off and, the, and then cauterize it and you'd wake up the next day and you'd be in a little bit of pain and they'd give you some pills and you'd go on about your life. That's not how it went. I mean, a lot of times there was no anesthesia involved and uh, it was, you know, biting down a stick. Here's a shot of whiskey and we're going about to cut your arm off. I mean, I don't know about you, but I get a paper cut and I'm wincing. I can't imagine having a bone saw going through me. So this was a scary time. And the fact that we were putting pe our own people through this is just a terrifying thought. So Stephen Crane agrees, thus the writing here. So we begin with an interesting scene. You've got this lieutenant who's dividing coffee up for the different regiments or for the different you know, groupings of soldiers, um, which is an um, interesting thing in that it's a day-to-day -day event um, that you know, should be seen as not a big deal. I mean, they're going to, they're getting coffee. They're back at camp, not in the middle of a battlefield. And as this man's dividing the coffee, all of a sudden he winces and he looks down and it's like shot kicks in right away. And he doesn't realize he's been shot. He's been shot in the arm. I believe it's his left arm. Uh, and then like everything slows down, which is a really common uh, technique writers use when there's not a suspenseful moment. I mean, he's been shot. There's not really a narrative here, okay? So the slowing it down and describing in great detail, and the great detail is it, the imagery sections are much heavier in writings from the 1800s. Uh, again, that's because these people didn't have access to visuals the way you and I do. You know, we don't process these things as easily. We just read it and it's like blah, blah, blah. They, I believe, processed it completely differently, and, and it really, you know, presented those mental pictures to them. For us, it's probably not as useful. But slowing things down and describing things in great detail kind of heightened the uh, suspense. I mean, it's just a, it's a really great writing technique. Um, it also is great for detailing what this man's going through, which is shock. The man is, uh, you know, in definite shock as you would be if this happens. This is a defense mechanism your body uses to help you deal with this. I mean, the man has got to be in immense pain, but because of the shock, he's able to continue. Now, it causes him to have all sorts of, you know, uh, mental mistakes. Like he's trying to put up his sword where he's using his sword to divide the coffee and he's trying to put it back in the scabbard. He like grabs it by the middle of the blade and tries to put it in with the wrong hand and just it, it turns into a mess until one of the other uh, soldiers has to help him do it. <clears throat> so then we get this uh, this image of him just wandering around aimlessly as the fight is breaking out um, or people are realizing that there's you know soldiers in the woods and everything's going to pieces and he's just wandering around with this hurt arm and uh, just the chaos ensuing around him. Now, of course, obviously the fact that he shot while he's doing nothing, he's trying to help divide up coffee for his people shows again that naturalistic element of, you know, you don't, I mean, you're, you're, 
just bad luck. The guy see the guy that had the rifle who happens to aim at you uh, got you. He may have been aiming at you with these rifles, and uh, it's just bad luck. And you got shot in the arm, which means you didn't die immediately. But maybe that's in a way bad luck too for this time period. So then you get over to page five ten. There's a couple of interesting things, some really poetic parts. Uh, because, you know, you, especially I, I saw a lot in European literature after World War One, there'd be a lot of soldiers that would take to writing. And they'd write very detailed and gory type of works, uh, not glorifying the gore, trying to be realistic. But um, writer, soldiers often, the, a lot of these soldiers are not, were not natural writers. So while, yes, it was firsthand account, it wasn't quite as uh, poetic and literary as like what Stephen Crane does here. So let me read this. It's in that first real paragraph on page 510. He says, A wound gives strange dignity to him who bears it. Well, well men shy away from his new and terrible majesty. It is as if the wounded man's hand is upon the curtain which hangs before the revelation of all existence. The meaning of ants, potentates, wars, cities, sunshine, snow, a feather dropped from a bird's wing, and the power of it sheds radiance upon a bloody form and makes the other men understand something that they, uh, that they are little. Okay, and that's that it makes people understand how small they are because, you know, it could have been you that was shot and your life could have been sent in a completely different trajectory. So, you know, that's, that's the writer's touch. That's Crane employing his gift to really make the idea of a wound seem almost mystical, which I think is really cool. Um, also, we see a little further down, I think it's still on page 510, uh, it's, uh, they're talking about the lieutenant who was shot. It says, he wore the look of one who knows he is the victim of a terrible disease and understands his helplessness. Again, that's naturalism. The idea that you can't do anything about your situation. And you may find yourself in a horrible one like this man did. He did nothing to deserve it. I mean, yes, he's a soldier. Um, but if he had been fighting on the battlefield, getting shot would have been an expected outcome. That, I'm not going to say that's fair, but that would have been you know, a, an acceptable outcome of fighting a battle. Being back at camp, you don't expect to get shot dividing coffee. So, you know, and that, and he compares it to a disease, same thing, you know. Um, we live in a, in a pandemic society right now with, um, you know, people breaking the rules constantly, not wearing masks, mocking people who do, acting like complete morons and not getting sick at all. And then you have other people who follow every protocol, do everything they're supposed to and still end up getting sick, which is obviously not fair. Um, but that, again, is what the naturalists here saw, was that you can do everything right and still end up in a bad position. So, um, you know, that's kind of what Crane's working with here. Uh, it's kind of disturbing that as he gets closer to the medical tent, he runs into people who, like, mock him for how he's got it tied up. Like, you know, that's what he was concerned about at the point. And then when he gets to the medical tent, the doctor there even mocks the, 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 the way it was retied. And it gets to the and he, he's even treated like he's a chore at this point. And it goes to the point where you see him almost having, not almost, he has shame that he was wounded, which he shouldn't have. Once again, that points to, you know, this being emblematic of how naturalism, you know, deals with all of our problems. You don't have to be being shot in war. It can be something as simple as, I see it in classes. You have students who, you know, you have some students whose brains work at a different level and they can just get everything at the first first try and they're they're brilliant. And you have other people who, you know, you can tell them the same thing five times and they struggle with understanding it. Now those kids are have amazing gifts outside of the classroom. But for whatever reason, that's not their gift. But they get to the point and I see you guys at the tail end where, you know, you this is ingrained in you and either you've overcome it or you just made it part of your character. But you'll have a lot of kids who that's why they're behavior problems, especially in like middle schools, because school's hard for them and they feel bad, they're ashamed by it, and there's a lot of things that cause that. It's not their fault often. And they're made to feel bad to the point of where they're ashamed and they react with by becoming, you know, the class clown or the behavior problem or whatever. So, you know, again, this idea that being shamed by something that's not your fault, that's not something you can control, that should never be a thing. And we as a society shouldn't put that on people. We shouldn't make people feel like they're in any way inferior because of something, I mean, honestly at all, but definitely for things they can't control. It's why racism is the most ridiculous crap on the planet. Are we honestly going to talk bad about a person because of an ethnicity that they were born with that they didn't even control and now somehow I'm going to make fun of people for that? That's the lowest level of stupidity, in my opinion. Um, and if somebody's offended by that, I don't care, all right? Um, so then as the story comes, close, comes to a close, let me dig myself out of, uh, you know, somebody getting angry at me. Um, we see this man getting closer and closer. He finally finds a doctor. And, you know, as we're on page 513 at the end, it shows him, you know, 
scared to go in for the operation because he's worried they're going to amputate his arm. The doctor swears, no, 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 I'm not going to amputate it. We just need to get you fixed up. And then as the last paragraph begins, we find out, of course, his arm was amputated. Again, nothing you can do about it. Um, he gets in there. He's, uh, you know, the doctor probably knew it was going to be the case, but lied to him to get him in the room. Um, so at the end, his arms amputated, and there's a, such a great example of naturalism as it closes when he says, "Oh well," he said, standing shamefacedly amid these tears. I don't suppose it matters so much as all that. So he's sitting there crying because his family's now, you know, looking at him as if he's not a real, you know, full person anymore, and they're all upset. And he's again noticed the word shame there, like he's ashamed of what he looks like, and he just says, "Oh well, it just doesn't matter." And again, that's one of the. Uh, the suffering in, in silent dignity elements of naturalism where the guy just, you know, accepts his situation and goes on about his life. Um, but it's still depressing, you know, the end of, that this is how this man has, is made to feel. So, you know, there's no narrative to this unless you want to talk about the guy's journey from, you know, being shot to getting the operation. But, you know, remember, literature's not always about that narrative. It's not always about that story. Sometimes it's about, you know, looking at, you know, putting yourself in someone else's shoes or trying to understand things from a different perspective. It's why uh, English and liberal arts are so essential, in my opinion, is that we have to learn that we're not the most important thing in the world, that we're not the only uh, lens that things are seen through, to see other people's experiences and to be more sensitive to that. And uh, that's one of the great things about that. Which brings me to our final question, and I kind of, talked about this at the beginning that I was going to get to this. So my question is, and your book very smartly include a question similar to what I'm going to ask you, um, and it doesn't always do that, <laughs> let's just be honest, but what's the value in, in stories like this? Why portray this or our war movies and things like that? What's the purpose in showing you know, humanity at its absolute you know, worst point? Um, I mean, is there value in, uh, you know, voyeuristically st watching other people suffer? Uh, is that something that, you know, we, we should encourage? And I think personally that it, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, it's the same reason for like, why would you listen to a sad song? You know, Christmas time comes around and I, I love Christmas music. There's certain songs you're not going to catch me listening to. Um, I'm not a giant fan of I want a hippopotamus for Christmas, but I'll tell you one way to get me to immediately change the channel is to have Christmas shoes come on. First of all, I don't like the music of it, but the lyrics are like enough to, I've, I've heard the song 50 times and I still want to cry about it. And that's not okay. It's Christmas. I want to be happy. So, I mean, but is there value in that? Of course there is. If there wasn't, they wouldn't play it because, you know, Country music makes a living off of two things, you know, uh, you know, the good old boy hanging out at the creek uh, on your truck uh, music, and then also there's a whole half of the albums that are typically sad songs, and uh, those tend to be the best-selling ones. We like to see, we we enjoy this commiseration, uh, and this you know joint suffering, and it allows us to kind of you know find this commonplace between all of us. That being said, I think the value in stories like this is again about perspective, understanding what people went through, and then overcoming it. This man shouldn't be ashamed of what happened to him. We shouldn't treat people that way. When we see people come back from war, we shouldn't, you know, if they're injured, whether it's whether it's a physical injury or it's mental stuff. You know, our world, maybe it's not so much about the physical as the stigma about mental illness that we put on things that we definitely shouldn't have. Um, you know, we should be caring and considerate and help these people, not judgmental. And that's what, you know, stories like this helped me think about even in 2020 when this was written back in the, uh, well, at least in the 1860s, if not probably later. So, um, you know, there's, there's so much value to this. Uh, yes, it's not always a fun read, but, you know, that's not the purpose of literature always, to have a good time. All right, that's just not the case. So it's okay if you do, and I would love it if people did, but that's really not, you know, goal number one. All right, well, that's our first example of naturalism. Um, I believe we're going to tackle several more. Uh, we're going to kind of step away from naturalism briefly. I probably should have done these in a different order, but we're going to look at uh, our next section. It's going to be uh, an excerpt from Frederick Douglass's uh, um, autobiography. 
and uh, very interesting. A great, great piece of writing. Frederick Douglass is, a, is an, an amazing human being and great to study. He used the, this used to be an assignment in ninth grade. No, ninth, eleventh when Miss Greeno taught. Uh, all of the juniors read his autobiography. We we don't do that because of the Great Gatsby, but um, it's not because the book's not great and not having a lot of value. So we're going to look at it. Uh, you can still apply naturalistic principles to this though, and we're going to. We're going to look at it from that perspective. Um, so that's going to be our next work, which I'll probably do the filming for in the next couple of days. Uh, I do anticipate getting to it m by Friday, at least starting it. We won't finish it, I'm assuming. So um, hopefully uh, you'll enjoy it. It's the wording in it's a little more complex, so be aware. But anyway, guys, I don't need to be talking about the next lesson. Let's finish this one first, right? So anyway, I hope you guys have a wonderful afternoon. Uh, again, I'm sorry for those of you who are getting this a little late. Uh, you know, getting back to school and starting this whole uh, process again, getting my feet back under me has been a little difficult. So I appreciate your, uh, your um, understanding. All right. Okay, guys, well, thank you. I hope you have a wonderful day, and I will see you back when we discuss Frederick Douglass.